Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014 with another Watchman video broadcast. Well, looky here. Somebody done sent me a bag of Del Taco. You ever ate there? It's pretty good. I find them down in the south. And every time I go south, I hunt up. Every time I go down south, like in Texas, I look for a Whataburger and a Del Taco. This one, they sent it to me. It didn't have any tacos in it. It had... This is one of those little kids' meal bags. You know, McDonald's does it, Hardee's does it, you know, all these, Burger King does it, everybody does it, Del Taco does it. Has a little kids' meal, and uh, they always distribute some sort of game or toy with it. This one caught somebody's eye. They sent it to me, and it caught my eye. Here we are dealing with, let me read this verse, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Did you count those? Because I said them slow enough, you should have counted them. Let's do that. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments, of this world or of the world and not after Christ. Four things there. Do you think, do you think that this Bible has an order? It has a rhythm to it. It has a cadence. It has a, a pattern, an easily recognizable pattern that you and I can correspond with. And when we see that pattern, we know what God's getting at. Because he gave us Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He gave us the story of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, um, and, and ascension up into heaven. And he is there for us, and he died for our sins. That's our gospel. That's how we have eternal life. That's what we, we believe on these things, and God grants unto us eternal life and righteousness, just like he did with Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed, to, and righteousness was imputed unto him. And I love that. And Paul said, be careful, beware. That means be aware of what's going on and what's coming into your eyes, your ears, what's coming into you so that man won't spoil you. I imagine the reason why they didn't send me any tacos in here was because they figured they would spoil over time. You see, everything of this world corrupts, doesn't it? It, it does. And that's what Paul was saying here. These things, like philosophy, and I hear a lot of sermons coming out of pulpits all over the world that are nothing but philosophy, vain deceit, the tradition of men. That's like following the, the Jewish Hebrew roots people. That's all about their Jew. Oh, the Jewish tradition said this and this and this. Don't, don't follow that. Beware of it. They're going to spoil you after the rudiments of the world. Rudiments is another way of saying elements. That's what's on this bag right here. It says elements. Build it the way nature does. And it has four little colors here. Isn't it so cute? Kids would just love this thing. And this is um, earth, wind, water, and fire. The four elements. This is the Elements of Wrath series. We're talking about the fourth kingdom. You can see the fourth kingdom here in Colossians 2.8. He mentions it by way of philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men, and rudiments of the world. That's how the devil's kingdom of principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places, that's how they are going to spoil Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, it's not possible. It is not possible to corrupt an incorruptible seed, the Word of God. It's not possible. But it is possible, according to what we see in Mark chapter 4 and so on, the parable of the seed and the sower, either stony ground or thorny ground, or Satan come in devouring the Word. It is possible to deceive people who at once thought they believed in the Word of God. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, beware, because they're going to come in four ways and try to trick you and deceive you and spoil, which means corrupt, spoil you, or like they, if you use the word in the Old Testament, they came in and made the, made the 
town of spoil and made the camp of spoil, which means they come in and took all their good stuff away. So they didn't have anything. When you go spoil a village, you go in and take all their, all their wine, all their food, all their gold, all their stuff, sometimes all their women. You go in and you spoil the town. And Paul said that you can be spoiled. He said, beware. Beware that what you're believing and everything that you believe, you know for a fact, and you can quote it verse by verse, comes from the incorruptible Word of God. Because if it doesn't, it, whatever good is there can be spoiled. It can be corrupted. It can be taken away from you. Lots, we know, we know beyond any doubt, lots of what one time was good men, good, solid preachers of this old book, over the years, what happened? Something got into them and spoiled them. The name of, of preachers, Jack Van Impey. Jack Van Impey used to teach and preach out of the King James Bible, memorized thousands of verses from the King James Bible. He holds up now in his broadcast a new King James Bible. This is the Word of God. Sorry, Jack. It's not. Something spoiled him. Billy Graham, something spoiled him. Um... Jerry Falwell, something spoiled these people. What was it? Philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men, rudiments of the world. Came in and spoiled these men. And you probably know preachers that at one time, maybe in your youth, oh, you thought, man, those are God's men. And then what happens years later? They're not the same anymore. Something happened to them. And I'll tell you what, I've seen enough of this go on. I'm, I'm all God, God. Don't, don't let me spoil. God, don't let me corrupt. God, don't let me go that way. I want to hang on to this book for the rest of my life. I want my last breath to be something out of this book right here. That's what I want. I don't want to be spoiled. I don't want the goodness of God taken away from me. But the elements, the fourth kingdom, and the principalities and the powers, this is what we're dealing with, uh, the elements of wrath, they have power over people. This is what we're dealing with. Let me show you what's in this bag here, Okay. This, this is nothing but pure witchcraft. It is absolutely pure witchcraft. It is designed to indoctrinate children into elemental witchcraft. There is a reason for it. It's not just to spoil them away from the Bible and give them a, a different religion. It has a goal. It has a purpose. And that purpose is hidden inside of this bag. I wonder what we're going to find here. Uh, don't choke on me. Okay, I won't. All right. Oh, we got, we got a little card here. This is the Terra Warrior. Terra means earth. It's one of the elements. The warrior. He is the friendly earth guardian. I want you to remember that. I'm going to put that right here. And see, what you do is, after you eat the taco, and you know most kids, pull the taco and the, and the nachos out, and they go... What's in here? What's in here? I want this. Here's what this is, okay? You're supposed to take the four elements, okay? You got green, you got earth, uh, air, water, and fire. And the earth warrior, see him right here, okay? This is his little face. He's got two really mean, ugly eyes. I'm telling you, that, uh, let me tell you who this is. This is the man of sin, the son of perdition, who has been cut in pieces and scattered all over the earth. We're going to learn about this. It's not, up to, um, it, it's not up to himself to raise himself from the dead. It's up to us. We've got to piece him back together. You never thought you'd see me playing with kids' toys on the Watchmen video broadcast. We've got to piece him back together, put all the, and you've got to collect all four. There's four components to this. Think about it. And you've got to bring all of these scattered pieces together to build the terror warrior. I don't, I don't, think, he, I don't think he's supposed to look like that. But it shows, you, it shows you right here what he's supposed to look like. And what you do is, you, you teach these children to piece together, let me get this out of my way here, okay? You, since there's no taco, I don't want it. You teach children how 
to do witchcraft by using earth, air, fire, and water. I'm going to keep these pieces right here. I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to show you what witchcraft and Wicca and elemental witchcraft is all about in this study. We're going to take our time because I have a lot of information on this thing to give to everybody. I'm still piecing it all together. And the things that you people are sending me, somebody, I didn't, I didn't find this at Del Taco. Somebody sent it to me. I appreciate it. God bless you for it. Because you're seeing now, uh, Pastor, we know that's not right anymore. We're not going to let our kids touch it. And you're right in doing that. Be very careful. He said beware. Because maybe, maybe you've made up your mind. This is the word of God and I'm going to follow it. And I don't care what anybody else says. Your children are still impressionable and the devil knows that. Principalities and powers. See, principalities will work around biblical authority. That is parents to get no, no witch has ever knocked at your door and said, Hi, my name is Esmeralda Indoor and I would like to teach your children witchcraft. I have some, uh, I have some bats we're going to bite the heads off of them later. Can we do that? Slam. You're never going to do it. They're never going to come at you that way. They're going to go around you to have power over a young generation that doesn't know this Bible or doesn't know it well enough to be able to protect themselves the shield of faith against them. They're counting on you, moms and dads. Do your job. Because they're going to they're gonna leave you alone to go after your children. I promise you, this is the evidence right here. All right? So, you send in any information that you think is relevant to this discussion because we're going to talk a little while about the elements of wrath. We're gonna, I'm going to show you just how deeply embedded these concepts are. They're in Del Taco. They're probably in other places, too. They're in the government. They are in uh, Hollyweird. They are in, um, they're in business. They're preaching behind pulpits in churches. I'm going to show you that as we look into this. Now, I mentioned the elements. What are the elements? Well, you probably have seen uh, in science class a periodic table of the elements. The elements, and I think there's like 108 or something like that. I don't remember. Uh, I may be way off on that one. But anyway, it's the, the things, the, the, the individual atoms that make up all of the things that you and I see, feel, taste, smell, hear, and touch. That's what the elements are, like barium and oxygen and hydrogen and um, kryptonite, crypt kryptonium or whatever it is. That's actually an, an element. Uh, but anyway, the ancients had this idea, and we're going to look at this, that basically the whole earth and everything that was, was made up of four base materials, earth, air, fire, and water. And we're going we're to study that. Now, here's the interesting thing. I had kind of known this in the back of my mind for years about the elements, and, and I heard it in school, and then, you know, started looking into witchcraft a little bit, and I'm going, okay, earth, air, and fire, and water. They kind of take that seriously, don't they? So I started looking at that, and then I noticed in the book of Galatians, Paul had mentioned something that to me was very interesting because in the book of Galatians, remember, Paul is the one who started out in chapter 3 and said, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Wicca, witches, use the elements. Who hath bewitched you? You should not obey the truth. And remember what he said back here in Colossians. He said, beware. They're going to come in and spoil you through vain deceit and philosophy and tradition of men and rudiments of the world. They're going to come in and bewitch you, beguile you, to try to pull your head away from what's in this book to all this other complicated junk over here, making stuff out of little kids' toys and things like that. And he said, somebody came in your church and bewitched you into learning something that was not God's plan of salvation for your life. And then he goes on, you know the book of Galatians as much as I do that Paul lays out a very, very straightforward case that salvation and God's terms of salvation and God's plan for your immortality comes from believing 
in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. But then people came in and they quickly replaced that gospel with another one. And Paul mentioned four times. He warned about three times in the book of Galatians. He said another gospel, another gospel. He said in, uh, what was it, 1 Corinthians? Uh, somebody's going to come and preach to you another gospel and another Jesus and another spirit. Four times. The apostle Paul warned us about another gospel. You see the pattern here. That's the fourth kingdom. And so Paul said, somebody come in there and bewitched you with things that are not right, things that are not true. They bewitched you with a doctrine that says, oh yeah, Jesus, Shmesus died on the cross. Okay, yeah, big deal. You've got to do the law in order to really be saved. Paul called it witchcraft. And so watch this. He mentions in uh, Galatians chapter 4, Galatians 3, he says, somebody bewitched you. Galatians chapter 4, he starts telling them how it happened. Look in Galatians chapter 4, verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Look at it. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Did you see that? He said, when we were children, we were under the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. That's what we were under. And if you don't, if you don't believe that, that that's what he was talking about, I'm going to show you that the Apostle Paul used this, not, not just the Apostle Paul, the Bible. The whole of the Bible uses this term exactly, guess how many times? Four times. Now I'm going to show it to you. So he says you were in bondage under the elements of the world. But then he contrasts that. He said, but when the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And what, do you, what work do you have to do to be adopted? You know, you just love that child and you adopt them. That's how it happens. And God loves us and God adopted us into his, into his uh, inheritance, into his line. We are the sons of God. It doesn't appear yet what we will be, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'll take that gospel over this nonsense any day of the week. Let's look at the other three places. The Apostle Paul mentions the word elements, not just Paul, but I think Peter in one case. Look at Galatians chapter 4 verse 8. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature, stop, stop, stop right here. By nature are no gods. By nature. Elements. Build it the way nature does. Nature. The elements. There's a connection here. This book, this writing, 2,000 years old. This one just came out a couple months ago. God foreknew things like this. He did. You had it written down as a warning to us. So he says, How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe, let's count, days and months and times and years. Four things. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Did you catch that? So here again, same chapter, Galatians 4, Apostle Paul mentions the term elements, and he said you're turning to the weak and beggarly elements. Did you know that witchcraft doesn't always work? Did you know that? And it's usually, when it doesn't work, it's usually based upon not what the elements couldn't do. It's what you didn't do right. That's how come witchcraft doesn't work. Witchcraft is based solely upon how you perform. And if you don't perform right, you don't say the right words, you don't say, as Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers and others say, if you don't say it the right way and faith fill the words and, and have positive confessions, if you don't do it that way, well, then you're getting nothing. And Paul calls it weak and beggarly 
elements. Did you know that if you're born again and you're a child, you're a son of Almighty God, you can ask what you will, and the Father will send it to you, and either He will send you exactly what you ask for, or He'll send you something that's like one billion times better than what you ask for. And it works every time. You see, my God is strong even when I am not, which is most of the time. My God is able when I'm not. My God has power when I have no power. My God is strong when I am weak. My God knows either what I'm asking for before I ask it, or he knows better than what I ask for, even if I ask for it and I don't quite say the words the right way. Because the Bible tells us, for we know not what to pray. The Bible also tells us that God is able to give us far beyond or far above what we're able to ask or think. So what if we're weak? I'm weak. And yet my God is strong. How many times? Always for me. So that's why Paul called it weak. He said, you want to you do this stuff? You want to follow after this nonsense? You want to go for a course in miracles? Waste your time and your money, and it's not going to work for you. There's always something they're going to tell you, uh, you well, you should have done it this way. Oh, you did this wrong, and, and you, didn't, you, didn't quite, you didn't say it right. You didn't do it the right way. Maybe you're not doing this, or you're not doing that. And all of this is about doing it exactly the right way. That's what Paul was dealing with in Galatians. He said, who bewitched you with that nonsense? Who came in there and told you that you're only saved if you're circumcised? You're only saved if you keep the law. Who told you that nonsense? He called it witchcraft, and he said it's weak and beggarly. And then he said, you observe days and months and times and years. Four things. By the way, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you'll see that God made the heavenly luminaries, the sun, the moon, and the stars, for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Four things. And he did it on guess what day? Four. Those are the powers and the rulers of the darkness that are ruling over most of mankind right now, but we're children of the day, and they have no effect on us. But over the children of darkness, they rule over them. And then you have people in just about every religion in the world, except Bible Christianity. You have people in all these religions, including Judaism, that says, oh, this is a special high holy day. God will only do things on this certain day, or we, have to, we can't do that today. We have to wait until this particular day here, and that at this particular day, we have to perform this ceremony, and we have to do this ritual, and we have to say these words, and we have to do this. And Paul said, you observe all that nonsense, and he said, it's weak and beggarly. Why not rather believe in a God that can do things for you 365.24 days of the year? That's how long the year is, by the way. And including all the leap years, why not believe in the God that can do things for you any day, any time, day or night, you call upon him, he's there for you and doing things. And God says, I don't want you to just honor me one day of the week and pray. I want you to do it every day of the week. Why not? So what if you skip Christmas and Easter? So what? You worship God every day of the week, every, every day of the week, every day of the year. You do it not because you have to. You do it because you want to. That's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament, I'll kill you if you don't do this. That's the Old Testament. New Testament, God says, I'm going to give you grace. And we take that and we say, God, any day of the week, you want me, you call me, I'm there. I want to serve you. That's the difference. We're not in bondage anymore. And it's not that we can, it's because we can get away with breaking all of God's laws <laughs> and still be saved. That's not, that's not what we believe. We believe that God loves us and God, is, God has died for us, shed his own blood on the cross for us. And we live now a new life and we serve him, not because we have to. Not because we're afraid of him, we do it because we want to serve him. And that's a whole lot better because if you want to serve God, you will and you don't need somebody telling you to do it every five seconds. That's witchcraft. But the observation of days, witchcraft is all about four high holy days. They come on the four 
seasons, the uh, vernal and autumnal equinox, and the winter and the summer solstice. Four high days, and then they've got four more secondary days mixed into there. One of them is Beltane, one of them is Samhain, which is October 31st, and so on. That's all witchcraft, what it is. Uh, Beltane, I think, is um, uh, May 1st. You have Imbolc on February the 2nd, 33rd day of the year. Think of that one. But anyway, all these witches gather, and they do all these things on these certain days, and they say, oh, we have to do this because this is when the powers are really great on these particular days, these four powers. And so we're going to invoke north, south, east, and west, and earth, wind, fire, and water, and up, down, left, and right. They do all these things because their power is stronger on these particular days. That's what they believe. Paul called it weak and beggarly. Well, anyway, that's the second occurrence of the word elements. And then the other two... Peter talked about. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, earth, wind, fire, and water. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then he says it again in verse 12, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of, of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Even in these two verses, you have the ideas of what these elements are. In verse 10, you have the earth. In verse 12, uh, you have the heavens, you have the air, you have fire, and everything's going to be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. And so you know what God's going to do? All of this stuff that you're basing your whole life and your creeds and your religion upon is going to vanish away one of these days. Poor Muslims who have to face Mecca because of the, the four, the square there, the, the Kaaba, they got to swirl around it seven times like the seven planets. They have to do that if they have any hope of achieving paradise. They have to do that. So what happens if Mecca is dissolved and melts with the fervent heat? What does that do for their religion? Roman Catholics have to go inside the physical body and the building of the church, the Catholic church, and not only that, they have to go to this little cross point there at the front of the church and they have to stand, this is where the funerals are, this is where the weddings are done, this is where you take the sacraments, you have to do it right in this little, in this little spot right here at the cross point, you have to stand right here in order for the magic to work. It's in every religion except Bible Christianity. And all of these elements are going to melt away one of these days. You ever see plastic melt? Okay, that's what's going to happen to all of this stuff. Don't put your religion and your faith on temporal things. Temporal meaning temporary. They won't last. That's what vain means. Vain philosophies, vain deceits. It means that they can dis... Uh-oh, I dropped air. Anyway, they can deceive you, and it looks like it's going to work for a little while, but it's all going to melt away one of these days. I need more air. Here we go. Here we go. There's some more air. All right. Now, here's what they look like. The four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. This goes all the way back. I learned this when I was in grade school, a guy by the name of Empedocles. I'm glad I don't have to pronounce that right to go to heaven. Came up with this idea that the, all of the world was based upon the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. But it actually goes way back beyond him. In one of the first religious ideologies that mankind became aware of before and after the flood, aside from uh, God working through the patriarchs and then through the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, we go all the way back to Babylon in the valley of Shinar, which they now call Sumer, the Sumerians, had this same concept, and the four elements were lorded over by four gods. You have Anu, the god of heaven, Ninhursag, which was earth, she's the female deity, the goddess, she's the goddess of fertility. You have Enlil, which is air, and Enki, which is water. So the Babylonian, I mean, it goes all the way back. This religion is the, other than God's faith, is the oldest religion in the world. And, and I will stipulate that I think there are still two religions in the world, Bible Christianity 
and witchcraft. It's called various things in various uh, traditions in the world, whether it's Kabbalah Judaism, Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism? Oh, bless you. Two, three, four. You have to do that, right? Oh, I'm sorry. You have to do that. One, earth, air, fire, water. See, they're opposites, aren't they? Doesn't matter what religion it's in, it's all witchcraft and it's based upon elemental magic. Uh, here's, here's a game. I saw for Google Android, it just stuck out like a sore thumb. Remember, and I'm going to show you this in a minute. They're teaching children how to do, oh no, how to do witchcraft. There is even a labyrinth here on the side. You got to get to the sacred space. So you start, you go through earth, air, fire, water, and then you exit in the center, which is, there's another element here that's hidden. That once you connect the earth, the air, the fire, and the water together, then the fifth secret element rises up out of them. We're going to see, we're going to see that in a minute, okay? Elemental search. There's these uh, word puzzles here that all the letters are jumbled together, sort of like Babel. And here's this game. Uh, four, you, you get four books of magic to unlock and study. You see that they're, just, they're earth, air, fire, and water. And then it says, you do this to restore the ancient kingdom to life. What, what ancient kingdom could that be? Let's go back and look, and we're gonna, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but we're going to see it here in a little bit. Go read Genesis chapter 10. We have a guy by the name of Nimrod, the terror warrior. He's a mighty hunter. He was king over four kingdoms, Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. That's a prototype of the fourth kingdom. That kingdom was destroyed in Genesis 11. God God scattered all the pieces of the remnants of that kingdom. And so now, the New World Order wants to gather them all together. Wants to gather Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna. Wants to gather those pieces and the remnants all back together again so we can have the rise of the ancient warrior king to rule over mankind once. You see it? That's what, that's what elemental witchcraft is all about. Here's, and I was just thinking about this, and I, I, I've never really thought of this before, but it makes a lot of sense. There are actually four individual characters in the Bible that are actively working against Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel. In fact, the whole word of God. They actively work against it. And you can see the relationship that they have with these four elements. Let's take a look at it. Satan, the air. Why? He's the prince of the power of the air. Let's see. Was there anything in a movie here a few years ago about an airbender? We'll get to that in a little bit. Babylon, which is the earth. She's the goddess. The beast, which he rises up where? Out of the water. Do you remember the opening scene of the first Percy Jackson movie? Where was he? They showed him sitting at the bottom of a swimming pool, and then what happened? Fine, he's just sitting there like he's meditating. He sits there forever, and finally he rises up out of the water. And he says, you know, I just feel more comfortable down there. Guess who he is? And then you have the false prophet, which he causes what to come down from the heavens? Fire. There you have them right there. Satan, Babylon, the beast, and the false prophet, earth, or excuse me, air, earth, water, and fire. They're right. This is who, we, this is who we're wrestling against. So when you see these four, or the 40s, or the 400s, or the 4,000s in the Bible, they're either going to be a picture of God saving people with the Gospels, or they're going to be a picture of this kingdom that you and I are wrestling against. In Japanese culture, you have the same ideas. You have earth, air, fire, and wind, or, or excuse me, earth, water, fire, and wind. But then you have the fifth element that they refer to as the void. The void, which means it's empty. Another word for that is vain. It's kind of like eating 
Chinese or Japanese food. You eat it, and you think you're full, and then like 20 minutes later, you're going, man, I'm starving. I wish I had something to eat. It turns your stomach into a void, right? But that's their concept, and it's the same religion. Look at it in China. The Chinese have these four spirits. If you ever, if you ever noticed... Uh, Chinese people have this idea of luck. It's translated as luck into English, and we think of luck as, oh, it just happened this way, and I got lucky, all right? Chinese and the Japanese have a different concept of what luck is. Luck is actually fortune that is handed to you. You become in favor to one of these four gods or one of these four elements. When one or all of these four elements, when you end up with more milk in your pail, when you end up with more rice in your bowl, you end up with more sake in your cup, you end up with more gold in your purse, then they would say that you have had luck or you have had the elements and the gods that were behind them bless them. And that's very important to remember, is that we're not really dealing with the power of dirt. Dirt has no power, has none. It is an inanimate elemental object. Um, it's dirt. It's nothing. When we die, what do we turn into? Dirt has no power whatsoever. So it's not really talking about the power that water has or the power that air has. We're talking about a spirit that is behind each one of these principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, Satan, Babylon, the beast, the false prophet. All of these are the spirits behind what these elements. So when the witches say, we're just using the forces of nature to do good things. We're not harming anybody. We love nature. They're, they're not telling the truth, probably because they don't know the truth. But the truth of it is, in the witchcraft manuals, some of which I've not read all of them. I've not read the whole volumes of these. I just kind of search them to see what they say. They actually teach that, yeah, behind the, uh, behind the water, there's a spirit. It's a water spirit that helps us do our magic. Even the Native Americans or First Nations, as they're referred to, I think, in Canada. You see the symbols? Earth air, fire, and water. When you look in the Hindu religion, you see the swastika. Guess what it is? Elemental witchcraft. Earth, air, fire, and water. And you can, uh, even anthropologists can see the connection between First Nations people or the Native Americans or any of that group that they would have migrated from uh, Mesopotamia or India or China or the Mongoloid races migrating through the land bridge or whatever coming down into North America and things like that carrying with them the scattered pieces of an ancient concept or an ancient religion. Manley Hall talks about this and he says what you see the reason why in one culture you'll have Diana in the another culture, her name will be Aphrodite. In another idea, her name will be Ishtar or Isis. And the thing is, they're all speaking of the same goddess. It's just that they have been scattered in different languages and amongst different peoples all over the earth. But essentially, that's, what he, that's the point he was getting at in the secret teachings of all ages. It occurred to Manly Hall that in every mystery doctrine, in every cult form in the world, didn't matter where it was from, they all had the same secret doctrine, the same mystery. doesn't matter if it was, um, if it was Apollo or Dionysus or, or Bacchus or Atlas or um, um, any of these other gods, Baal. It uh, doesn't matter. It's all the same dying God who was killed, his body cut in pieces, scattered all over the place, and now the, the, the new mystery religion wants to bring all of his pieces all back together again like Humpty Dumpty to put him back and make him whole. And that's the same concept you find among the uh, Native Americans. You'll find in the, uh, in the Indians, the real Indians from India. You find it in Germany. You find it in Russia. You find it in Africa. You find it in Europe. You find it among the Aztecs and the Mayans and the Cherokees. It's the same religion and the same concept 
I'm telling you, there are two religions, Bible Christianity and elemental witchcraft. Always has been, always will be until the end of time, and then God will do away with that nonsense, and we will be at home with God. In Europe, uh, they basically had the concept that everything was built upon the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. Alchemy. Alchemy is a system of, of pseudoscience, or as the King James would say, science falsely so-called. Of, of, uh, if, you, if you take lead and you melt it and then you cut it and then you diffuse it, you dissolve it, and then you do this with it and perform that with it, and there's like seven functions of taking lead and you do all these things with it, and then... You could get gold out of it. That's what alchemy, I learned this in school. What is alchemy? Alchemy is, you know, turning lead into gold. On the surface, that's what alchemy is. And the, notice that the word alchemy has the letter C-H-E-M in it. And that sounds like chemicals. Did you know that modern chemistry, and I'm talking about real science, modern chemistry, and the, th the way they do things is based upon the European alchemists who were the first chemists. They, were, they learned about the minerals and the things that you and I take for granted. They learned about these things because they were performing alchemical four element witchcraft in order to turn lead into gold or turn mortals into gods. Genesis chapter 3. I have it in my suspicions that modern chemistry has not diverged from the goal of finding out how to turn humans into immortals. That's a topic for a different day a different Watchman video broadcast. I'm putting together the research right now. I got some people helping me. But you watch for that. Notice this, and look on here, the, the four women. You have the symbols, earth, air, and fire, and water. Notice that they are composed of triangles, uh, and two of them, and they're opposites. Two of them pointing down, two of them pointing up. Two of them have a line going through it. Two of them are empty and void. And on top of the heads of these four goddesses, or these four women, you have the image of a man, the image of an ox, the image of an eagle, and the image of a lion. Where does, where does that come from? It comes from Ezekiel. The alchemists were believing that the, uh, the power of alchemy actually came from cherubs. That's what you see in Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, they're called cherubim in Ezekiel. They're called living creatures in the book of Revelation. John saw the exact same thing. So even in alchemy, there is an acknowledgement that the powers behind the elements were spiritual in nature. That's what's going on. We still see it. We see it in chemistry. We see it in biology. We see it in nuclear physics. Remember when we were talking about the circle? We see it everywhere. Mankind is trying to find out how he can, number one, open a portal to a different world. Number two, how we can rearrange things so that we can become gods. Let's get an understanding a little bit of how witches think. And you say, Pastor, why do I have to know this? Well, technically, you don't. You can know Jesus Christ and Him crucified and live a very happy life. But, Somebody's got to know that there's witchcraft all around us. Somebody's got to know that. Somebody's got to, and I'm not saying everybody does. I'm not chastising you if you don't care. Somebody's got to know that their children are sitting in a Del Taco learning how to do witchcraft. So you teach them here at a young age. Because, let's be honest, 17-year-old boys don't sit around going, Ooh, what's in the bag? Can I put, Mom, can I put these together now before I eat? They don't do that. Okay? Get them while they're young. 
And when they grow up, I think, I think there's something coming. I don't know what it is. There's something coming. And there's going to be a generation of people on this earth that are going to go, go, wow, I get it. We've been doing this. All. We know how to do this. Earth, air, fire, and water, come together. Let's bring the guy up out of the pit. Something's going to happen like that. Okay, I don't know what it is. But let's understand a little bit how witches think and how they see this thing with the elements. Silver Ravencroft, we've talked about her, the light of sacred flame. She said, witches use the energies around them to assist in raising power. These energies manifest as the elements, earth, air, fire, water, and spirit, or as the Japanese put it, the void. Um, the four elements of nature, earth, air, water, and fire, form the foundation of natural magic. The elements are associated with the cardinal points of the magic circle and with a hierarchy of spirit beings called elementals. The Mithraic mysteries hold that man must rule the elements before he can attain spiritual wisdom. Accordingly, he must successfully undergo the initiations of earth, air, water, and fire, each of which test a different aspect of his nature and being. That's from the Encyclopedia of Witches, Witchcraft, and Wicca. You see the page numbers there. Notice that in that, in that uh, writing there, that earth, air, fire, and water form the foundation of natural magic. Build it the way nature does. So, am I right in this? Yes. Teaching people the Mithraic mysteries. Mithras was Apollo. He was Dionysus. He was Bacchus. He was Baal. He was Tammuz. Mithras is the dying god. The man must rule the elements. He must learn how to fit all of these together. I'm the creator. Man is the creator. I'm going to create me a terror warrior must successfully undergo the initiations of, of earth, the initiation of air, the initiation of fire, and the initiation of water. I'm telling you, I would not let my kids play with this. I would not let them do it. They must do that. And when they do that, when they get him all pieced together, now they've got, and I want you to think about this. Here, your child, or let's say your neighbor's kid, because you're going, my kid ain't doing that. Here, the neighbor kid is sitting at Del Taco, and he's doing exactly, exactly what John wrote about in Revelation 13, that the false prophet talked everybody into making a what? An image of the beast and then giving him life. That's what, this, that's what this game is. This is probably the simplest way in the world to understand what elemental witchcraft is and what its purpose is. I think God had this person send me this to show you what's going on. Wiccans use this force of earth, air, fire, and water as the force of all of their magic. There isn't anything that they do that's without the force. Does that, does that term ring a bell to anybody? Do you think that um, George Lucas knew a little bit about elemental witchcraft? Sure he did, because that, and if you go back and watch Star Wars Episode Four the first one. You'll find out that uh, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you must, you, you must learn the ways of the Force, young Luke. You must do this. The Force is the Force that's all around us. It, it binds us all together. That's, there's the good side and the bad side of the Force. It was great acting, right? Great special effects, great story. The problem is it started teaching people about this force that only witches knew at the time. Witches are watching this going, that is so cool, he's talking about us and our religion. Oh my goodness. Uh, anyway, earth, air, fire, and water. You see, uh, see what it's associated with, north, south, east, west, um, winter, spring, summer, autumn. And when all of these are brought together, then you have the spirit. And I like that, or the, uh, in some some ideologies it's called ether. In the Japanese concept, we learned 
the word void, which is, I think, another name for what we find in Revelation 9, the bottomless pit. So ask yourself, what is in the bottomless pit? The terror warrior. His spirit, he is in the bottomless pit. He's in the void. And there's something about when the people of the earth all bring together the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. I don't understand it all yet, how it's going to work, what's going to happen. Is it going to be like a big rock concert, like in um, the, you know, the plain of Dura with uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his image? I think music plays a very, very big part of this. I absolutely do because Lucifer knows music. But it's going to be something that's going to bring everybody together and they're all going to sing Kumbaya or something like that and out pops the terror warrior, the king of the bottomless pit. This little graphic here is from the Encyclopedia of Witchcraft. And it says, the five elements are earth, air, water, fire, and spirit. In Wicca, each element is associated with a direction in the ritual circle. Earth's direction is north and air is east, water is west, while fire is south. Spirit encompasses all directions because it surrounds and is part of everything. That idea of surround. Remember when we were talking about the sacred circle? That's the spirit. And when you get in the sacred circle, you're going to talk to the earth, the air, the fire, and the water, the north, south, east, and west, uh, the winter, spring, summer, fall. You're going you're to invoke these gods, these spirits. They're going to come help you. And they are actually the ones that have the power to do witchcraft. And think about witchcraft. Think about what it is. Think about a witch casting a spell, a love spell. On t- and I, the commercials that come on TV, advertising shows for, that they want my children to watch. And I'm watching it going, they're trying to teach my kids witchcraft. They're trying to teach my kids that if they do this and perform this and do this, then something's going to rise up out of it. Uh, 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 we're not watching that. We're not going to be part. We're not going to fall into that because I know my nature. My nature, if I was 10, 11, 12 years old, and that stuff comes on, I'm going, I'm going to watch this. This is so cool. Oh, yeah, I want that. I want that. I did. As a child, I wanted this. I'm glad God saved me from this. Now watch this. Again, from the encyclopedia. I think this is uh, Wicca for complete idiots or something like that. Uh, You can summon the elements to attend your ritual. Many witches call them in when they call in the quarters. Ask the elements to stand outside your magic circle and guard it. I want you to remember that they are the guardians. That's what this is, the guardian. Or just have them witness your ritual and any magic that you do. Depending on the magic that you are doing, you might want to call upon one particular element. For example, if you're working with issues of love and sex or transformation, you might want to summon fire to your ritual and draw on that intense fire energy. Alternatively, if you were working with issues having to do with emotions and adaptability, then you'd want to draw on water. You'd contact earth energies for stability, growth, or giving birth, and you'd want to use air for any magic dealing with communication or ideas. Verizon had a uh, a marketing campaign a couple years ago called Verizon Rule the Air. You get it? Because when you, and according to the Wiccans, when you want to invoke a spirit and help with communication of ideas, you invoke air. Rule the air, make the air deliver the message for you. I'm telling you, it's in businesses, and it's in governments, and it's in pulpits. We're going to see that. So let's go back over this. Earth. Represents stability, giving birth because of the, of the goddess. Air represents communication. Fire is transformation. How many, and we talked about this in the power of the flame. Go back and watch that. And you'll see all the, all the preachers and all the evangelists and all the, all the goofballs there talking about, Oh, God, we're going to bring fire to this place. Fire! Everybody's on fire. Are you, are you burning up yet? Are you, on, are you on fire? Have we ignited the spark in you? Elemental witchcraft. That's what it is. Transformation is what fire is all about. Water, emotions, adaptability. In other words, it's fluid, it's liquid. It can go this way or it can go that way. And that's how they use it. Now, they mentioned here that these elements are ruled 
by a spirit of some kind. Now, I'm not going to get bogged down into the, uh, you know, the salamanders, and the, I can't remember all the names. They, had, they named all these spirits. I'm going to keep it biblical. There are spirits that work through these elemental forces. This is why Paul called it witchcraft. They, it's funny because in the witches' books that I've read, the ones that I research, they don't mind telling you that these spirits are dragons. Let's find out what this is all about. There are five dragons. This is from the Complete Idiot's Guide to Wicca. There are five dragons, fire, air, earth, water, and spirit. The dragons come from a long line of truly awesome, noble creatures. If you work with them, you need to have a lot of respect for them. They can get angry. And like a Force 5 tornado, that is a frightening thing. Dragons, like the ancestors in the watchtowers, are sleeping if you need them. You stir them gently. And there's even this whole thing about how, how you can slowly awake the sleeping dragon. So just get this in your mind. If you know enough about the Bible, you know that dragons are not our best friend. We're going to study that. We're going to learn this. If they're going to call them dragons, spirits, devils, the devil himself, they're going to refer to it. They're going to be honest and tell you, that's what, that's what the spirits behind our witchcraft is. It's dragons. At least they're being honest. But they think all these dragons are good. How many, how many dragon movies have you seen in the last, oh, 15, 20 years that were really mean and bad? Um, there was one, uh, I can't remember, back in the 90s about a, the dragon's heart. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, let's see, How to Train Your Dragon. Guess what it was? It was subtle indoctrination into witchcraft. The concept of training the dragon is what they were referring to here in elemental witchcraft. You need to be careful to make sure the dragon does what you say and don't make them mad or they can get really feisty. You think your kids are being indoctrinated? One of the popular things in the last 20, 25 years has been Japanese anime, Japanese style animation. And Japanese style animation draws, and, and remember, this religion is everywhere, draws from centuries of Japanese religious thought some of the concepts we find unfamiliar to us in a semi Christian nation. And so the goal has been to indoctrinate children in America and in the West into these Japanese concepts. So there is one of these anime features called Naruto Shippuden. I'm probably not, pardon my French, all right? But take a look at this graphic here. What do you see? Five dragons, earth, fire, water, and air, and a fifth one, a big, mean, nasty one, the ether. See, the, the four come together to bring out the really big guy, the mean, nasty one. As I'm talking through this stuff, I just had this thought, as I'm talking through this stuff, probably some of you, maybe your children, are going, gulp. Um, I play a video game that has me doing this, this, and this, and this, and then this comes out. This happens. Is that bad? They're teaching you witchcraft, okay? I'm just telling you what the video games, the cartoons, the kids' meals, they're teaching you witchcraft. So, we understand. This is from the Wiccans. The Wiccans say, we're not evil. Stop saying that about us. We don't all wear all. We don't all wear big black hats and ride a broom and have big warts on our ugly noses and buck teeth. We don't all look that way. No, they don't. They're trying to make themselves appealing to everybody. Let Wicca is a beautiful religion, a feminine religion. It's a religion that embraces, oh, I want, there's a tree. I want to hug you, tree. Can I use you for magic? That's what they want to appeal to everybody. But they're telling you that dragons give the witches their power. So what I'm going to show you is, I'm going to show you that this hates this. That's what it does. Let's look at it from the scriptures. Isaiah 13, 19. And Babylon, 
The glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Remember what Babylon is. Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Part of Nimrod's kingdom. And the Bible says here that Babylon is overrun and infested with dragons. Her glory is gone away. Now her, her house is desolate. Means that there's no life in it. And the islands cry, and the beasts of the islands cry because her house is desolate. And dragons live in their pleasant palaces. Now we understand that the dragons have come in and they have taken over what used to be a glory, glor, uh, what used to be a glorious thing. Jerusalem, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt in the book of Revelation. How is the faithful city become an harlot, the Bible says? How, has, how is it that we have seen what used to be good churches, good denominations, with good Bibles and good teaching? How is it that we have seen that Jerusalem turn into Babylon the Great? Because at some point, they rolled away the stone of the King James Bible... And now Wicca has moved in in its place. And now the dragons have come in. And the dragons will hold power so long as this book is not present. Isaiah 34, 13. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. Uh, Jeremiah 9.11, And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons, and I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Jeremiah 10.22, Behold, the noise of the brute, which is, means a beast, is come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. The cities of Judah. That's God's place. That's God's kingdom. Judah's the fourth born son of um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How is it that Jerusalem and God's people turned into desolation? Thorns started growing. You know what thorns represent? Sin. God cursed the ground with thorns. Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. They represent the sinfulness and the curse of sin. And now where we want good things, thorns grow up. We know what must be done to them. Thorns... According to Mark chapter 4, you know what they do? They choke out the word so that it can't grow inside of a, a young believer's life. It can't do it. And they produce no fruit and they're cut down and cast into the fire. So it starts out with unrestricted, rampant sinfulness, unconfessed sin, unapologetic sin, unrepented of sin. That's where it starts. And those thorns grow. And pretty soon, this book cannot abide in that place. God withdraws his spirit. It's become Ichabod. And then what happens? The dragons and all their power comes in. And see, you gotta have, if you're going to have a, a church, it's got to have a religion. And since this religion is not present, it's going to have this one in its place. That's what it's telling you. Then Ezekiel 29, 3, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Jeremiah 46, 8. I'll explain this in a minute. Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers, and he saith, I will go up and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. What is this, what is this dragon in the river? What does that have to do with anything? A guy came all the way down from Canada to talk to me. He said, Pastor, he said, I've got to show you something I see in the Bible. He said, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody else talk about it. He said, I want to show it to you. And I said, okay, go ahead. He began to show me scripture after scripture after scripture of how God uh, typifies and uses the idea of a stream, a brook, or a river. You see, in heavenly Jerusalem, there is a pure river, clear as crystal, that flows out of the throne of God. 
all that's beautiful. You know what that is likened to? The pureness of the word of God. Jesus said, Jesus washes the church, his bride, in the water by his word. And he said, Pastor, he said, when you see a clear, nice, calm river, then what you see is you see the pure word of God. And, and with clear rivers and clear waters, you can see right through them. You can see everything there is down there. Isn't it? Don't, don't we love that? That's so beautiful. He said, then, Pastor, you see, you see muddy rivers, dirty waters, troubled rivers. In Ezekiel 32, uh, he's talking about, again, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he talks about the whale that's in the seas and the whale that, that foulest up the waters with his dirt. And so here, this river is dirty water, it's corrupted, it's defiled, it's unclean. It's like right over here on my, right over my left shoulder is the Mississippi River. My dad worked on the Mississippi River. He was a dredging inspector, which means that his big boat went down the river and scooped up sand and silt from the bottom of the river, blew it over to the side, to the banks, so that the barges could get up and down the streams. Very vital function that he did. He did this for years. And they were saying, I, I learned a little bit about the river from him. And there's something that I've always known about the Mississippi River. You can't see an inch into that water. It is dirty, muddy. And the reason why they have to dredge all the time is that the river just constantly is bringing new dirt and new silt and new things down. And there's things in that river that they would, that they would dig up. My dad dug up one time. They hit a coal barge. And I'm talking big chunks of coal. I know I'm talking... But I'm just giving you the illustration here. The idea is, is that Mississippi River, you cannot see what lies under the water. Think about that. The great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers. The dragon loves to be concealed. And he's always concealed in anything that is impure and dirty. That's his covering. That's his secret. He's hiding in corrupt, foul, dirty things. I'm starting to put together this idea that the human body has a very neat relationship with this planet we're on, where we came from, the earth. You ever notice how dry, parched ground looks like the back of your hand, the old dry part skin, you're, even the little lines and everything. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that if you look at an overhead map of a river, of a river and all of its tributaries, it looks exactly like the human bloodstream and the blood circulation and the veins and the arteries that are in the human body. I'm going to show you something. Because he said, Egypt riseth up like a flood and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he said, I'm going to destroy the whole earth again. This, he's going to, that river is going to rise up and cover and flood the whole earth just like the Nile River used to. Now I'm going to show you something from the scriptures. Revelation chapter 9, there is something hidden in a river the Bible calls the Euphrates. Now I believe the literal Euphrates River. But I also believe in a spiritual river. And when I say spiritual, I don't mean it's philosophical and it doesn't really exist. We're just to think it in our mind. No, 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 no. I think the, this world that you and I live in is a shadow of the real fourth dimensional world and universe that exists around us. I believe that there is a river, a real river. The ancient mystics used to call it Arcadia, and it referred to an underground stream of occult knowledge that always flowed under the surface, and, and you couldn't see it, you couldn't detect it unless you really know what you were doing. And in that stream, in that river, there's something hidden and buried in that river that God says, I'm going to let it out one of these days. And it has to do with this number. Revelation 9, 13. The six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, see the number four, which is before God, saying to the six angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for, look at it, an hour 
a day and a month and a year to, for to slay the third part of men. Stop right here. Here we have four angels. These are evil ones. And they are they're bound in the great river Euphrates. All right? They're in a chain. So Paula White talks about her, the God that's on the inside of her, needs to be unleashed. The God that I serve doesn't, doesn't even wear a chain, much less be wrapped in one. But there's something in the great river Euphrates, there's four spirits that a trumpet is going to sound and they're going to loose these four out of the great river Euphrates that have been reserved for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. See the time sequence there? And the seasons, and the, you, you observe days and months and years and whatever? Think about it. Okay, this is, this is elemental witchcraft here. So they're going to unloose, unleash these things. They're going to come out. And what are they going to do? They're going to kill a third of mankind. This great river Euphrates, I think it's more than just the river that runs through Baghdad. Here's why I think that. Genesis chapter 2. Notice what the Bible's saying. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That, um, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. One, and the gold of that land is good. There is delium and onyx stone. The name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Hiddekel. That is, is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Notice that Euphrates is number four. And I think it indicates a fourth dimensional or a spiritual realm river. And I think that it's this river that those four are bound up in and they're awaiting to be released. Now I'm going to show you the connection. Okay, this may or may not have any relevance to what we're talking about, but I think it does. I have a heart that's hooked in with all of the rivers and the tributaries in my body. I have this one heart, it's like the Garden of Eden, and out of my heart go four vessels. I have four chambers in my heart, and these four vessels take the stream of water and blood and all of this stuff and f make it flow throughout my whole body. You see the connection here. So I think that this body is very closely connected to this earth. And you know what? When I die, the earth can have it back because I don't want it anymore. I want something better. But remember, the religion of witchcraft seeks to take this body, transform it, so it doesn't ever die anymore. Earth worship is human worship, as far as I can see. So, here we have a dragon, and he lies in dirty water. You know what that is? A Course in Miracles. It is a, it's mystical concepts that you would never understand in clarity. The book. The book. This is corrupted words that's hiding a dragon. Quantum spirituality. Corrupted words that are hiding the real dragon and the four that's bound up in there. Freemasonry, the cosmic serpent, all of these things, the Book of Mormon, all of these things that, that, that we have talked about over the years. This right here, is a dirty water. See, they're not telling you the truth. They're not going to tell you, play this game so you can learn how to take the mark of the beast. On sale for $3.99. They're not going to tell you that. They're going to hide it. They're going to cover it in mystical ideas and little games and things like that. It's the dragon lying in the dirty river so you can't find out who he is. So now let's look at what the book of Revelation says about this dragon, all right? Revelation 12, 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now watch this. Here's what the, here's what the dragon does. Okay? 
this dragon loves to eat the word of God. That's who this baby is. Here's this woman. She is, I believe she's Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, which is the mother of us all, Galatians. Here's this woman, and she's giving birth to the man-child. It's a type and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God. We learned from the parable of the seed and the sower in Mark chapter 4, that when the seed, the Word of God, falls by the wayside, the fowls of the air, they have wings, they fly down and they eat it up as soon as it falls down in there so that it cannot take root and grow inside of a person's heart. This is the barroom crowd. You go in there passing out tracks and they go, yeah, yeah, I've seen all that stuff before I grew up in church before I'd never go back. Here's another beer. They're not coming to church. They're not going to be saved. The, 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 their life is so full of devils that they consume the word as soon as it's there because the devil loves to eat the word of God. It's his nature. So, witchcraft says that they get their powers from dragons. And I'm telling you, any place where the dragon is hiding, any place that he is, his number one goal is to destroy and devour this book. And so, you may think it's harmless. You may think that, oh, you know, my girl, Samantha, she's in there and she's in her room and I see her, you know, reading these Harry Potter, but I don't know what that stuff's all about, but, she, you know, she's got posters on the wall and she's, you know, doing this stuff in her room. I, it's that kid stuff. That's no big, you know, we still go to church. You know, we, we like the church because of the music there and the pastor's cool and he doesn't, he doesn't tell us anything mean or bad. So we like going to church there. You think that's okay. You think it's okay for your kids to be playing with stuff and watching stuff on TV and movies and reading books, and they're doing this in schools. Oh, we're getting the children to read the devil's religion. You think it's okay. But I'm telling you that any place, any scenario, any station of life where the dragon is hiding there on the scene, his number one goal is to destroy that book. And it's happened. It's happened in households all across America, all in Europe, in Africa, in the Orient, in Australia, in, in, in North, South America. It's happening everywhere. Every place that these elements thrive, they're hiding a dragon in there. They're hiding a spirit. And those spirits love to devour the Word of God. It's happening in churches, everywhere. It's happening in government. Our, our government, United States of America, at one time, they, it, even if they weren't solid, born-again, Bible-believing Christians, the politicians of 200 years ago revered this book. They wouldn't dare speak anything against it. They would have, they would have votes in Congress that we think our military boys need Bibles. Yes, let's spend government money and print Bibles and give them to our boys in the military so they can be encouraged to fight for America. That went all the way up until World War II we were doing that. And now our politicians, what's happened? Dragons moved in. Witches moved in. Witchcraft moved in. And now the people who are running our country, they hate this book and they want to see it gone. You know why? Because this book exposes their deeds. And they don't want that. So they want to get rid of this book. Now, witches believe in and worship and practice the magic of dragons. Let's see the fruition of this. Let's see what comes about as a result of it. The four, earth, air, fire, and water, come together. And here's what they do. Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. The beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, number one. His feet were as the feet of a bear, number two. His mouth is the mouth of a lion, number three. And the dragon, number four, gave him his what? His power and his seat and great authority. I want you to think about that. We're going we're to stop right here for this week. But I want you to ponder that the beast 
the Antichrist, the opposite of Jesus Christ, the king of the bottom of the split, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Assyrian, the giant, all of these things that the Bible refers to him as, when he comes up, earth, air, fire, and water, lion, bear, leopard, dragon, and the witches believe that the dragons have power over the elements. And here, the beast is going to have all of the dragon's power. This beast is going to be the master warlock. Oh, he's going to wrap it up in nice little Del Taco packages and make it look sweet and nice. He's not going to look like Sauron of the Lord of the Rings. The evil, nasty thing. Although, there are some people in this world that would love for him to look like, that's cool, dude. They would love for him to look that way. I don't think he's going to look, I think he's going to look like what everybody wants him to look like. And he is going to have all of this power in himself. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. And he's going to rule over all mankind. And people's going to say, who is like unto him? Who is able to make war with him? That's right. Because he says, your powers are useless against me. Ha, 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 ha. That's him. He's going to have great power. The dragon's going to give him all his power. Let me show you the opposite of that. In the four Gospels. Remember what Jesus did after he died? rose from the dead and was about ready to go into his father okay remember what jesus did he said uh, he took his took his disciples he gathered them together and he said uh, he said in matthew chapter 24 verse 13 jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth i have all power therefore go ye and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Yeah, they're going to have this beast that's going to have all this dragon power, all this element's power. He's going to be the master witch, master sorcerer. My Savior has more power than their Savior. You see, he has the power of the rudiments of this world temporary power my Jesus has power forever and he gives us that power and that power is used to resist the devil and to war against principalities powers rules of darkness spiritual wickedness in high places if you're into witchcraft I can tell you you're wasting your time it sounds good. It's a, and by the way, yeah, it lets you do whatever you want to with your flesh because witches don't care. But it's not going to last. And eventually, and I'm going to show you this as I close out this series of the, the power of witchcraft or the elements of wrath, I'm going to show you that these elements are the exact things that God is going to use to destroy you. That's right here in this Bible. You study it out for yourself. Go read the book of Revelation. Start looking for earth, air, fire, and water. Go look for it. You're going to find out that God is going to use these elements to destroy you. You can be on God's side and follow Jesus and know what real peace and real power and real love is all about and forgiveness of your sins. That's what you can do. Or you can stick with this and have a little jolly for a little while. And then God will destroy you. But He loves you. He wants, he sent his son to die for you in four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The reason why, there's a reason why God hates witchcraft so much. He hates it so much because it doesn't work and it doesn't last and it puts people in bondage. Bible Christianity, not the world's corrupted version of it that you've seen on TV or that you probably experienced in your life, but real Bible Christianity brings freedom. I'm not doing this because I have to, because God, God can hit me if, if, if I don't. 
Oh, don't wake up, don't wake up my God. He's mean and cranky when he gets up in the morning. That's what the witches were saying about the dragons. Don't be careful about waking them up, man. They're like, ooh, they're, ooh. Oh, I did that once, never do that again. Uh, I don't like, I don't live in that kind of fear. My God's very good to me. He's very merciful to me. He loves me greatly. And I don't have to perform all sorts of rituals and get his attention to wake him up just the right way. I can just cry, God, I need help. And my God helps me. That's the God you need. Open this book up, King James Bible. Open that book up and read it. God will show it to you, all right? This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. We're going to keep on going with this. I'm going to show you some things next time. Bye-bye.